So good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome back to the fourth virtual conversation meeting that we have with SAC leaders today. It's absolutely an honor to have uh, with us two very, very special and um, very, very senior leaders from Pakistan and Sri Lanka today. I take the, this honor and privilege of introducing them. But before that, I would let you know that uh, Pursuit of Political Peace has recorded four virtual meetings with the leaders of SARC. In about the last eight months, we have been able to uh, reach out to 100% leaders across cabinet ministers to UN reps to thought leaders, um, policy, um, econo you know, economists, uh, activists, social and business leaders, as well as spiritual leaders. We are documenting the conversation and with each, each time we document a conversation, we create a framework based on their uh, feedback or a breakthrough that happens during that discussion. And then that framework is shared with um, our member base, as well as those people who are not members but are interested to know what's going on in SAC and want to have a deeper understanding of their region. So today we have gathered to talk about SARC, which is just not a buzzword. Uh, it's something that we've heard before, but we know that it's been very inactive, ineffective. And because of that, we have suffered, uh, not only India as a nation, but eight countries altogether. Uh, Mr. Ehsan Malik, I take, I will introduce Mr. Ehsan Malik to you first, and then I'll go on to Mr. Atukurada. Mr. Malik's background, he is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Pakistan Business Council, a research-based business advocacy body composed of the leading business in Pakistan, including the larger multinational companies from 13 countries. PBC's transformation, PBC's main goal is transformation of policies and operating environment to achieve sustainable growth, employment, exports, and import substitution. Prior to joining PBC in January 2016, Mr. Assam was the Chief Executive Officer of the Unilever Pakistan for nine years, a period in which the business quadrupled in size. In a 24-year career with Unilever, Assam served as CEO of Unilever Sri Lanka, and also the regional of businesses in Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria, and spent several years in the head office in the UK. Before joining Unilever in 1991, Mr. Malik worked for a Pakistani conglomerate with interests in media, pharmaceuticals, hotels, attractions, partner, partnership with Bike Laboratories, Intercontinental Hotel Corporation, Ford and Gulf Line. That's like a lot of experience and wisdom today. So Mr. Hassan is also a member of the Board of Directors of Abbott Laboratories, Pakistan Limited, National Foods Limited, uh, Gol Amber Textiles Limited, and Standard Chartered Bank, Pakistan Limited a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales. Mr. Malik is an alumnus of Wharton and Harvard Business School. I welcome you once again, Mr. Malik, formally to Puro Innovations virtual platform. And uh, it will be an insightful and a landmark discussion because the experience and the exposure that you have in the revenue generating streams, which perhaps could snap this vision out of poverty very soon. Uh, the second participant that we have today is Mr. Rohanta Atukurola from Sri Lanka. He has served the country as chairman and board of director for Sri Lanka Export Development when exports crossed 10 billion. Then as chairman Sri Lanka Tourism, he restructured the organization for the country to attract 1.8 million visitors. Mr. Atukurola is, was also the commissioner general for the World Expo in 2015. He then went on to be the chairman of the 30 billion rupee retail chain, Lanka Santosa, where he turned around the organization. Mr. Rohanta Otakarala has served three presidents of Sri Lanka during his tenure in the public sector, and then went on to serve UNOP, United Nations OP for five years, when the best project was won by Sri Lanka. Um, and he himself won the uh, APJ Abdul, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam Pride of the Nation Award. He's currently board director, Hemus Leisure Aviation Group, and many other private and public sector boards. 
Academically, he has a double degree in marketing, MBA, and a doctorate in business administration. He's an alumnus of Harvard Kennedy uh, School, and he's been awarded the Exceptional Rotarian of the Year. Uh, currently, Mr. Atukarala is the regional president and CEO of the Microsoft-owned global artificial intelligence company, Cooltract, to Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Pakistan. So we have someone who has so much exposure in tourism development, sports, and of course now in technology, which is what uh, the world is looking at today. I know that uh, everyone would want to know why are we doing this and uh, what, what do we really mean by peace in SARC? So I but genuinely feel that SARC is really ready for peace. Uh, the fact that leaders are coming forward um, and documenting their thoughts with us, it's a positive progress that we are enabling thought leadership in the region. Uh, for generations, we've had brain drain because of which the, the regular and the mundane problems like conflict have eaten us up. And they're not new. You know, the, historically, the world has faced them in different times in history uh, in different ways. However, they were thought leaders to snap nations out of it so it could progress. The best example I could give you today is the animosity between Germany and France. Amidst the backdrop of Cold War, World War I and II, they've had five wars before that. The War of the Spanish Succession, 1701 to 1714. The Seven Years' War, 1756 to 1763. Wars of the French Revolution. Wars of the First Coalition, 1792 to 1795. And War of the Fourth Coalition, 1806 to 1807 before World War I from 1914 to 1918 and 1939 to 1945, World War II. So can you imagine, uh, can you imagine European Union without them today? You cannot. So we have to imagine SARC because SARC has so much more a peaceful and friendly history than uh, and we were never and we are not enemies. I, I just feel that we are facing certain problems and uh, uh, we are unable to really uh, come out of them. So that is why I have initiated this project through which we can document problems and present frameworks to solve them. Now, economic interdependence is one of the proven framework uh, in all the violent regions so far. And I don't see why it won't work in some. And uh, that was about why we are doing what we're doing. And the next big thing after these four virtual meetings that we have done covering SAC uh, region 100% is that we would like to uh, culminate into our annual event where we will anticipate participation from re uh, leaders across the region. So that is about Furo yesterday and today. Uh, I would now perhaps uh, want to begin with Mr. You know, Asan Malik. So my, my first question to you, uh, Mr. Malik, is with your kind of experience and with your kind of uh, exposure and education that you have, uh, what is your opinion on SAC region coming together to be the next powerhouse? And how do you think we can make that happen? Sure. Okay. So, so first of all, uh, let me thank you, Rachna, for, for your very kind introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm totally flattered. I don't don't deserve uh, most of what you just said. Um, having said that, um, you know I've had the privilege of uh, working uh, in a in a global multinational, as you mentioned, Unilever. Uh, and Unilever is one of those companies that, uh, unlike other multinationals, organize their South Asian business as a South Asian business. Um, so India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, uh, were all managed as one, uh, one, one large regional business. Uh, you know, companies like Coke and Pepsi, etc. They have their local companies. You know, in Pakistan, for example, reporting into Middle East, uh, and and India perhaps reporting into into Asia or India maybe is large enough to report directly to the head office. Um, so I have therefore had the privilege of uh, traveling very frequently to India, uh, but also spent about five years working in Sri Lanka. So from a first-hand experience, I know that there's more that unites us than divides us. Uh, 
Uh, yes, certainly the current political uh, environment, particularly in the context of India and Pakistan, and we've got to, you know, put, put the monsters on the table, yeah? Uh, it may be an inhibiting uh, factor. Um, but uh, if, if I look at it from a narrower interest or a narrower perspective of Pakistan alone, uh, geographically, Pakistan uh, on, 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 the, on the western border has got Afghanistan, uh, which is a member of, of South Asia, uh, but but having said that, uh, the uh, uh, you know the, the security conditions there are not ideal, uh, and we are not able to trade. Um, we have Iran on the other side, which is not part of South Asia, but that is uh, affected by sanctions. And of course, we got India with a critical uh, you know relationship between the two countries. Unfortunately, inhibits uh, trade. Now, having said that. Uh, there, there is informal trade. It goes to other countries, and we'll come back to that. Um, that that just leaves uh, China. And the interesting thing is that if you look at the inter uh, inter regional trade of South Asia, you know less than about six percent of uh, the trade uh, in in South Asia is with each other. Um, so as far as uh, you know, uh, the, the the regional context is concerned. Pakistan then only has one country where it, can, it is able to trade, and, and by virtue of free trade agreement, it has a significant amount of trade with, uh, with China. But even if you move away from Pakistan and if you look at India, India actually has greater trade with China than it does with the rest of South Asia. Um, so this is a, a, a very unfortunate uh, set of uh, you know, circumstances that we find ourselves. Now, of course, there are certain hard realities that we've got to face up to. The fact is that most of the South Asian countries produce items where they compete with other South Asian countries. So if there isn't a whole lot of potential for us to export to each other, for example, of textile goods. Textile goods happens to be the largest export item of Bangladesh. Uh, it is certainly of Pakistan. It is, I think, one of the largest in, in, in terms of uh, you know, trade uh, in Sri Lanka. Uh, I know that tourism was, was a very large foreign exchange earlier, and of course, Lanka, we talk about that. But but I'm just purely on on trade, uh, I think textiles and tea, uh, I, th I think were, were significant. Uh, so we are not able to trade with each other on textiles. Uh, then then of course there are other items where we ought to be able to trade, but then the political differences get in the way. Um, having said that, uh, when it comes to a third party trade between India and Pakistan, there is a significant amount of trade that comes through the Middle East uh, through to to Dubai. Uh, but also via Singapore. Um, and there is direct trade, fortunately, still uh, on, the, uh, on the pharmaceutical uh, you know, APIs uh, because those are life-saving drugs. And I think both the governments realize that there's value in continuing. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I don't want to continue. I think we can come back. But I, I really believe there is a lot of potential. And as uh, Ratna, you mentioned, unless there is trade between the countries, it is very difficult to build relationships. I know that there are cultural ties, particularly between India and Pakistan, and also Bangladesh, for that matter. We were one country, you know, not 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 you know about seventy five years ago, uh, and there are lots of bonds. I mean, there are families that you know have uh, relationships across the border, and so on. And so we, you know, the cultural ties are, are significant and they're strong. Uh, but we'll come back to you know the issues confronting travel and visas and, you know, police reporting and all, all those we can come back to that. So I, I just stop there. Right. So in your experience, how do we deal with uh, this kind of social crisis in some countries? Okay, I, 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 think, I think it is important that irrespective of the political uh, differences uh, between the various countries, and, you know, uh, I have to apologize that we end up talking about India, Pakistan in the main. I mean, there are uh, other very important, uh, you know, members of South Asia uh, or SARC rather. Uh, and of course, Sri Lanka is, is one of those. Uh, but but just this focusing on India, Pakistan for the time being, uh, I think if a way could be found where travel and visas uh, can be facilitated, even if they are for people of a certain age, because you know they are they are they are likely to be of a lower risk from a security point of view. I think that would be a great start. There was a time when you know both the countries, I mean people from both the countries used to go to each other, attend uh, literary festivals, other festivals, etc. Now those are those are opportunities where you create those bonds. 
Um, and and you know if you if you are able to uh, to to you know get that people connection going, of course, what what has really helped post COVID is the is the virtual connect. Uh, and I've personally attended a number of uh, meetings, virtual meetings, where we've had counterparts from India and of course the rest of the world also. But but at least you know it's continued between India and Pakistan. And so I think what we're trying to do today. Uh, I think is a great, uh, is a good example of the connectivity that can be maintained, even if physical connectivity cannot be maintained. But of course, physical uh, you know, connectivity is, is, is very, very important. Uh, so the communication, I think, needs to be maintained uh, across multiple platforms, not, not just uh, culture or literature, uh, but there are lots of other things uh, you know, that, 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 that we can continue to connect. Uh, so I think those are, those are important. Now coming back to uh, coming back to trade because trade at the end of the day, as you rightly said, uh, is is a very important component of of, of building a a regional uh, you know relationship. Um, so we are very fortunate at Pakistan Business Council that we are the counterparts uh, and we have a have a, uh, a an agreement to exchange information and knowledge and know how with the uh, Confederation of Indian Industry uh, and indeed. Uh, the Indian and the Pakistani governments about 10 years ago formed an India-Pakistan Joint Business Council, where CII is the secretariat for that in India, and Pakistan Business Council is the is the secretariat for that in, in Pakistan. And as before the relationship really got you know, uh, sort of worse in the last you know, four or five years, uh, there were multiple occasions where uh, the PBC delegations went over to India and the CII delegations came over to Pakistan. Um, and whenever we get the opportunity to meet in third countries, I think we, we you know, we, we still continue, and we learn from each other. Uh, and and uh, as as you know, in the introduction you mentioned, at that PVC, you know, we've got almost a hundred members, uh, and they come from seventeen different sectors of the economy. So we've got a very rich uh, uh, component of businesses represented here, and of course, CII is significantly larger than. Uh, than PVC and you know has been there for more than about 150 years, etc. So they've got a lot of knowledge. Uh, so so that knowledge, that exchange, and the and the you know providing each other platforms, I think is one way. As soon as the as the political relationship permit to be revived uh, and the physical connects to to start happening. Uh, so I, I think again I will stop here and then and, and you know we can move on to the next uh, asset of uh, this discussion. Yes, that's fantastic. And um, and how can your organization, which is Pakistan uh, Business Council, help in developing economic interdependence in the South region? Have you uh, taken steps already, or are you thinking about it? Where are you on that? Yeah. Okay. So so you know, as part of our uh, uh, business advocacy. Uh, and since we are a research-based uh, business advocacy body, uh, we spend a lot of time on research. Uh, and and, and the, the areas that we research cover trade, which is obviously of direct interest to, to what we're talking about. We also talk about, or we also cover competitiveness. Uh, and again, we know that there's a huge amount of uh, uh, you know, benefit that can come from uh, sharing the best practices Given, given that India has got scale in, 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 in a lot more categories and a lot more sectors than we do in Pakistan. So there could be a lot of sharing of knowledge and best practice that can come from you know, across the border. Um, and and so, so that's, that's one, one aspect that, that we continue to work on. Uh, in the area of energy, that's another area uh, where, where we are struggling in Pakistan and in India, uh, you know, in India, they opened up uh, the market on, on energy. Um, so there's a lot of uh, learning, et cetera, uh, again, that can come from, from across the border. Um, so I think those are things that we can do. What does Pakistan have to offer India? So for example, Pakistan has a surplus capacity in cement. Uh, and until, until you know, political situation uh, sort of, you know, got out of hand, uh, there was a lot of cement going from northern part of Pakistan into, into India. By the way, when I worked for Unilever, the reason why Unilever established its ice cream factory in Lahore was not just because, you know, Lahore happens to be the capital of the largest province in Pakistan. It was to serve the, the Haryana and uh, uh, Punjab markets in India, subject obviously to, to political, uh, you know, relationship permitting that. 
The reason why Unilever is as far ago as in 1948 established his principal home and personal care facility in Kadim Yar Khan, which is virtually on the border with, 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 uh, with, with uh, India, was again to, to service the demand uh, that, that you know, would, would exist in the western part of India, given that at that time, most of the production facilities of Unilever were in the west, in, in, the, in the east and the south. Um, so you know, so there, there, there is a whole lot of uh, benefit that can come from cooperation. That is correct. And you mentioned energy. And uh, we as a region, as Himalayan region, we are facing global climate crisis severely and we will be impacted more which will get get back the problem of uh, you know migration and illegal immigration and things like that so we really have to think because just recently we had floods in bangladesh and assam we have had more than 10 10 or 15 lakh people who were displaced within snap of the day right so if you don't think about renewable energy energy efficiency today together as a region then the glaciers are not going to be kind to us and we have to really be mindful. So I, I want my next question would be that well, our relations have you know, really uh, deteriorated over a period of time. I don't need to get into details, uh, which negatively impacts the business communities, right? And the future of economics. So if SARC reignites its spark, what good things do you think uh, will happen, which can take place and uh, which would help us in economic interdependence again? I think foremost, foremost the, the cost of goods would come down. So the consumers would benefit. Um, now, there is a, a school of thought in Pakistan which says that, well, because India, Indian industry has scaled, they are able to outcompete. Uh, you know, goods that are being produced in Pakistan, uh, then, you know, it, the, the, the unemployment will flow uh, because those, those sectors would, would close down. I, right. I personally don't think that that would happen because actually competition is good. Uh, if you are able to get goods directly from India, you know, without having to go through Dubai or, or, or other, 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 you know, trading uh, uh, sort of ports, etc., uh, then that would actually trigger uh, innovation in Pakistan uh, and, and, and of course, bring the benefits of scale, et cetera, here. The other aspect is that some of the goods are coming from China anyway. Um, and and if, we can, if we can start sourcing the same items, provided, of course, they're competitive uh, and of the same quality from across the border, then, then just the saving in the cost of uh, logistics or transportation would justify uh, you know, continuity of, of trade. So those are just two aspects that I can think of. of I think that those are really two very good aspects. Um, so Mr. Malik, we are called Puro Innovations and uh, we always take advice from our speakers. So it's good to know perspective from across region and cultures. What, what innovative ideas do you have for us? How do you, you think that we can propagate and uh, double up impact in the region and contribute in world peace? I, I, I believe, I think you must continue to do what you're doing today. Um, I think, you know, this interaction is, 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 is very essential. Uh, we must continue to talk as long as we're talking. Uh, I think there's a hope. Uh, when we stop talking, then, then I think we've lost hope. So I think first foremost, I would say you continue to talk. Uh, you widen the circle. Uh, I mean, I wish there were more people from Pakistan uh, attending today. Uh, certainly, I would wish that there was somebody from Bangladesh here too. Uh, you know, I, I believe we must have had them in the past. Yes, maybe yeah. possible. Yeah. Um, and I so, and so I, you send them the recording as well as the framework that we develop after this presentation. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So, so, so I think that would that 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 would be good. I, I, I think the other sorry to interrupt, but the other other thing that you know I think one one both sides need to do is to make sure. See, one aspect of trade is is the impact that the tariffs have. But as you know, there are lots of non-tariff barriers also that, that uh, inhibit trade. Um, so I think the, that, in, in fact, in many ways, those are bigger challenges. Um, so if, if a brand, for example, you know, goes across from one country uh, and then is, is seen to be you know, coming from any you know, country uh, and, and then and the shop that is selling that you know, gets burnt, then that's not obviously helpful. Um, and obviously, that you know, right. so those items do not come. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a question of building up through media uh, and through other means a, a, a momentum 
uh, towards openness and to, towards accommodation. Um, and in the end, I think all the countries in South Asia would benefit from that. That is true. That is true. I'm, I'm so happy that you agree with interactions are important because some people think we're just talking and we don't help. But I believe that it helps. So if you have to give one advice to the world leaders and the leaders of SAC, what would be that? Okay, so I, I think first of all, uh, one wants to start with one's own country, right? Um, I, I think what, what we need to get, uh, uh, you know, e the leaderships in our own countries to understand the importance of, uh, of, of trade. Um, I, I believe, uh, you know, all countries are not at the, at the same level. Uh, maybe, 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 you know, the leadership in India understands trade better than, than perhaps the, you know, the, the leadership in Pakistan. Uh, but I think that's where we come in, you know, as an organization, we come in and then we keep repeating those messages and bring forward the positive benefits of, uh, uh, you know, the, the inter, inter regional trade. Uh, so I think that's, that's a task that we must do in each of our countries and certainly we should do in Pakistan. That's true. And the next thing you should do is probably get in touch with CII. I'm sure you already are. And yes. uh, perhaps we should be able to host a delegation together and uh, yes. have a conversation. Yes. You know, even if we don't end up doing trade, we can end up doing conversation. And that's, that would be a very good first point to yeah. uh, go in the right direction. So yes. thank you very much, Mr. Malik, for your uh, insight into what uh, Pakistan Business Council is doing what your leadership is bringing on the table for them and how hopeful you are, as I am, for SARC. And I would request you to stay back so we also hear back. We also listen uh, uh, from Mr. Kurala sure. from Sri Lanka. Both of the uh, panelists today, I found through the resource directory of Harvard, uh, we have an alumni bulletin. And um, I was so impressed when I read uh, all the work that you've done specifically when Ronta and I had a chat and he said, while he was uh, chairman of Export Development Council in Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. he did 159 rounds of the embassy to develop one of the projects. And I think he will dwell more into that. What I really liked was the persistence that he has, the grit that he has. We really need more people like Ronta who can move and shape some offices sometimes which close the doors on us. So, um, you know, my first question to you, Mr. Kura, would be that most of our regional countries go to the West, right, or other developed nations for debts. Do you think that's the right way? Um, if not, what is the solution? Thank you very much, Rachna. And um, let me in the outset, uh, thank you so much for driving this particular initiative uh, among a part of the world. Uh, I don't know uh, whether you guys know, but I've been working a lot on trade in the Asian region, uh, you know, and been working very closely on the free trade agreement in different parts of uh, um, our part of the region. And, uh, you know, just to cite, uh, I think Ishan very beautifully explained how our trade in the SAC region is about 5.3%, but, you know, in ASEAN, uh, the the integration among countries is 35% on trade. And if you take EU, it's 55%. And if you take NAFTA, it happens to be 60%. So uh, it's very sad that we are not driving trade between us. And uh, the re recent study by the Asian Development Bank says that ASEAN is worth about $2.4 trillion in terms of wealth uh, with just 630 million people. But Sri Lanka, or our part of the world of um, ASEAN, uh, I mean, in terms of SAC, is about uh, $1,000 billion, which is the, the kinds of opportunity that we have. And uh, with about almost uh, 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 two, Two billion people among our countries, you know, which is which is the kinds of opportunity which exist, and uh, there is no proper forum to drive this, you know. And before I actually answer your question, Rachna, uh, I mean, SAC has been continuously trying to do so much of integration work. Uh, you know, you had the SAC Free Trade Secretariat, you had the Development Fund, you had the SAC Poverty Fund, you had the SAC. Food Bank, which was established in 1988, 
Uh, you had the SARC Energy Fund, you know, which was set up because 72% of our population of SARC happens to be in the rural areas. Uh, you had the SARC um, uh, Climate Change, which was done, uh, called the Malay Protocol. Uh, you know, there's so much of opportunity in SARC but the political will is not there. And that's why we are living at 5.3% at kind of integration rate uh, while the rest of the world is seeing uh, forward. So uh, as you know, my second point I just want to make is that there's a recession coming to the world. And because of that recession, uh, you know, ADB and World Bank, as well as IMF says that we will see some kinds of uh, trade uh, decline uh, between us. And the world is going to see a whole um, uh, flattening happening. So in that background, I think it's an opportunity for us to look, relook at ourselves and see what we need to do. With regard to the debt, see, um, our countries are essentially very focused towards raising money from overseas in terms of managing uh, uh, our, our internal affairs. But I think uh, it, a time has come uh, rather than looking at debt, we need to first ask ourselves whether we are running our countries efficiently. So, Ratna, the answer to your question is, you know, rather than looking at debt and seeing whether we need to go to the West or whether we need to go to the East, uh, let's first ask ourselves, you know, what kind of reforms that we need to do in terms of maybe running the way that our countries are run. I mean, Sri Lanka, for instance, our expenditure is 3.4 trillion rupees uh, per annum. Our income is 1.4 trillion. So, so, you know, if, if we are not going to look at, uh, you know, reducing our expenditure, right? We'll be continuously living in debt. And, and when you really go, I mean, Eshan, uh, um, who's been the chairman of Unilever in Sri Lanka, you know, heard a lot about you. I've been also at Unilever for almost two and a half years. And then I joined back to uh, Diversity Lever based in India for about three years. I was based in Bombay. Uh, I mean, we all know that, our companies have gone through reform and we had to restructure. Uh, we had to relook at our business model. And it's just that sadly, you have the best brains in the business world, but that integration to the political uh, hierarchy is not there. And, and we are not looking at reforming ourselves. A classic example, Rachna, is that if you look at our expenditure of 3.4 trillion, you know, the half of that money is spent on forces the security forces. So if you were to reduce you know, say 500 million, move that whole group into restructuring and move into the construction sector. You know, you could just imagine your total expenditure comes down to about uh, say 2.5 trillion. And then we will look at as to how we can spruce our uh, income to 2.4 from the current 1.4. And it can be done because it, you know, it's a rich country. So I'm just taking a case in point that rather than looking at whether we should look at the West for debt or whether we should look at the, the East for debt, let's first ask ourselves, let's restructure before, you know, there are five other countries in SARC who is going to follow us um, uh, in, the, in the Sri Lanka way. I don't know whether you are aware, but there are 61 countries going to go the Sri Lanka way is the latest uh, that has been uh, announced by World Bank at the discussion that I was held last two weeks. Um, you know, you have uh, uh, the countries that they've identified are Maldives, uh, they have identified Pakistan, wow. there are four states in India, which is in the same way. So, 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 you know, I think it's time has come for us, I would call this tipping point leadership, where we need to ask ourselves how we want to uh, integrate business to the political hierarchy. And it's our duty right now to see how we can bring that reform into the country. Uh, in terms of not just looking at the West or the East for debt. Over. That's true. That's true because, uh, you know, when you, uh, we, are, we are very busy defending ourselves against each other. We're like these, you know, small family where like the, kid, the, the brothers fight. It's exactly the same thing. To a layman, that's how they should understand this problem because we are dying of hunger, right? So we are unable to feed our people, but we are saving their life on the border. We are saving, right? But they're dying. But we are actually rated next to Haiti when it comes to hunger index, when it comes to health care, when it comes to poverty, when it comes to conflict. We are in the least. We are almost next to Afghanistan when it comes to peace, right? 
what are we waiting for? So I, I we are we are spending sixty billion dollars, and as SARC, I think more than hundred, just defending ourselves. So having said that, next question: Sri Lankan economic crisis, right? And you just said that the World Bank is another another sixty one countries, two states in India, Pakistan, Maldives. So welcome more problems. Uh, what can we learn immediately? Because we don't have time. SARC does not have time. What is the way forward? Uh, see, Rachna, the first thing is, I, I'm so happy that the government of India, whom I work very closely with, uh, I got the first funding in of uh, $2 million into the UN from the government of India. And at that time, it was uh, uh, your finance minister, was Pranab Mukherjee, who actually moved a motion in parliament over there in the Lok Sabha and got, the, got it ratified for the first time in the world for government of India to drop money into the UN. And I built that actual industrial zone in Jaffna. Now, I was music to my ears when I heard that uh, there is going to be a ferry that is going to run from uh, the east, uh, west of uh, Sri Lanka into Trivandrum. And, and secondly was, of course, there's going to be an air traffic between Palale and South India. And I remember when I spoke to uh, the finance minister at that time, I said that trade is going to come in. And he asked me when, and I think uh, uh, today that has come. Uh, we are now uh, the South Indian um, uh, companies can come and set up their business in actual industrial zone, uh, which is north of uh, Sri Lanka. And then you know the the trade integration will start getting stronger, uh, which actually uh, is going to be the first point I would say very strongly that we should start working on because India has been such a good uh, a friend to us. Uh, they have given us uh, uh, crude oil on the line of credit at two and a half to $3 billion. Uh, yesterday it was announced by uh, yeah, the, the ambassador that there's another three and a half billion dollars credit that has been extended. So, the, I mean, India has been a very good friend and I think it's time right now that we further, uh, you know, the opportunity has come Rajnavaya uh, people cannot now, uh, you know, talk about nationalistic ideas like saying we are Sri Lankan and 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 you guys are Indian, you know, because you know people are have, starving. Uh, Esa knows about this uh, because he lived in Sri Lanka. That when you look at the 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 hierarchy of our uh, population, you know, you get forty percent of the people who are in the DSCC group and maybe another about thirty percent in the CSCC group, which is the lower spectrum. And, and, and those guys are suffering when you have a fuel crisis or when you know, farming goes at, uh, out because of a wrong policy decision. So now, you know, nobody can Rachna talk saying politics. They, they, that, 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 word, that word does not exist anymore because people are dying. You know? So this is the best time for my second point that I'm uh, floating in this today's discussion is that, you know, how does, Sri Lankan exports reach up to the middle income of India. There is, uh, there is 400 million population over there. And uh, I mean, I had long discussions with the embassy in Sri Lanka. I mean, I, I remember one particular gentleman who was heading the trade secretariat and right now I think he's the ambassador in EU. Uh, you know, uh, when three of our exporters got into India and they started doing business, they bought over a plant in Delhi, Rachna, and after they revamped the whole operation under the Manchi brand name, uh, the owner who has liquidated that property to the bank came back and said claimed ownership. And the government of uh, the, 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 the court awarded the, 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 the business back to the Indian uh, owner. But then, you know, uh, when I cited this issue, when I was of chairman of the Export Development Board continuously, Subsequently, you know, the Indian government intervened and somewhere they got the property back to the exporter. And today, Manchi brand and the Dambro brand are classic examples in India of a Sri Lankan brand. So I would float very strongly the idea, Rachna, that, you know, the tipping point has happened. We have, we, the, the non-tariff barriers between states have to be broken out in India so that the 50 million kilograms of tea that could be exported must be given uh, priority and the 7 million uh, pieces of uh, apparel, which is under the free trade agreement, must be given because right now the utilization is below ten percent. Oh God! Below ten percent, <laughs> and and so 
uh, you know, when I talked to the last time, Saroja Sirisena was the uh, counselor head for Mumbai in for Sri Lanka, and right now she's the ambassador in uh, UK. She was talking how uh, Sri Lankan consignment of tea went, and then in Mumbai, uh, what happened was that the the NTBs came to play, and subsequently the 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 exporter said, rather than me paying them a rate, let me just burn this tea on the in the port. You know, so 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 these are unsung discussions, but I think it has to be brought to the surface through the forums, like what you are saying, so that if we can do two things, Rachna, from today, if if there are two key actions that I'm floating, number one, drive business from the south of India to the actual industrial zone. Number two is open up our our exports to the middle income of um, the 400 billion population in India. If you can drive these two points under your uh, leadership, uh, under Fudo, uh, the branding and the platform, uh, I think uh, you know we have done justice to uh, today's uh, discussion. Correct. Okay. Uh, I think that I will leave that to you. Um, uh, my job is really to get you going and push you that we can do this. Uh, but I'll be always there to support. And, uh, and Ramta, what, so we've discussed the periphery, right? What is the root cause um, of this continuous economic, political, and social crisis in South, from your perspective? See, I think the, uh, the root cause is that, I mean, each of our countries have our own problems, so I'm not going to delve into that. You know, the challenges that we have, um, but uh, which all of us are aware of about. Uh, I mean, I, I work very closely with the Pakistani Rekit team. I worked for Rekit for almost 15 years and I was managing the brand uh, Cherry Blossom Shoe Polish. So I used to be in and out of India and Pakistan both. It was very interesting because both brands are like 70, 75% market share over there in Pakistan and India both. So uh, I don't want to delve into the the issues in each of our countries, which we are all about, we are aware of. But if you ask me what is the real root cause as to why SARC is not driving trade from say 5.3% to 10%, is that there is no political will. There's no political will. Uh, so I think it's time has come. Uh, if you see that the West is going to go into a recession because the energy prices in Germany, I was told yesterday, has gone up by 300% because of the, uh, the Russian issue with Ukraine. Uh, and that is going to trigger this whole uh, uh, recession coming in. And they're saying it's something that the world has not seen. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for us to see how we could integrate and, and stop trading uh, raw material, but start trading brands between our countries. Uh, and, and if we can, if the political will is there to do that, uh, that would be fantastic. I remember Rachna once I was invited when I was citing, uh, I think when I, when I was chairman of tourism, I was invited to this forum in, in, in the south of India. And uh, there, was a, there was a secretary to the Ministry of Trade in South India, uh, Tamil Nadu. And, and he was saying that he's developing a strategy to, to move Tamil Nadu away from India. So I... Uh, I asked the guy why, why he, do that. he said that when you look at the competitiveness index, the uh, top 500 companies in the world's manufacturing processes are in Tamil Nadu. So if he takes Tamil Nadu as a country in the competitiveness index ranking, Tamil Nadu will be a top three country. Oh, no. <laughs> you know? so, so, I mean, the point, I'm, it was a conceptual discussion, but the point what I'm saying is that is the kind of aggressive thinking and reform that we need to start bringing into our countries. And if you do that, uh, you'll suddenly find that our 12 billion exports is nothing. I mean, I yet go back when I was when I was appointed chairman of uh, export development board, I had a meeting with the cabinet of ministers. And the first meeting I said that in 1990, the exports of Sri Lanka, Bangladesh and Vietnam, Rachna was $2 billion in, in 1990. Yeah? Okay, by 2005, I mean, as of today, Bangladesh is at $52 billion. Oh, wow. Okay, uh, Vietnam is at uh, $211 billion. 
Okay, and Sri Lanka is at 12 billion. Yes. So you could just see the kind of reforms that has happened in those countries that has spruced themselves up, you know, yes. and, 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 one, and, and one country that we can talk about is Bangladesh, where everybody says, you know, there are so many sweatshops and all that. You know, what did they do? They linked up with ILO, had a program to alleviate the whole standards of production. And today, EU and Bangladesh is so strong, almost 30 billion, $35 billion of exports of apparel comes only from Bangladesh. So, so the question is that, you know, we, we need to, we have a classic examples of companies who are really doing it right. You know, so, so, so I would strongly urge is that if you ask your question, why did we, what is the real reason why SAC is not uh, driving like the ASEANs and the NAFTAs and the use of the world? Very simply, there has to be a political will. Thank you. Over. <laughs> Correct. Um, so, so in your opinion, if SAC region came together, it would be the next powerhouse. How do um, you think we can make that happen? Me, when I say me, I'm, we know if there's no political will, then it's like uh, common people like you and me and everyone else who comes on a platform. Uh, some are very established leaders um, in government or uh, politics and they have the authority and some have no authority like me, but an initiative uh, and, and willingness to do it. How do you think we can do it? See, I think... Um... Uh, a very interesting question. Um, I, in, in my view, I think a time has come, uh, Rachna, where we need to allow youngsters to come and take our positions. You know, it's a very tough uh, thing to, uh, it's easy to say rhetorically, but, you know, when it comes to practically doing something, you know, giving a youngster a, a chair to sit is, is quite a challenge. But then, you know, we saw this in Sri Lanka. I mean, private sector should have taken the lead uh, in this current economic debacle, which was totally mismanaged by the policymakers, which is a fact. And it's a story globally. It's not a secret anymore. Uh, I mean, you had agricultural philosophy that was launched of organic, where even if you, if you, even if you make Sri Lanka totally organic, uh, you know, the market is not big enough for us Sri Lankas to supply. Let's be very clear. So, you know, you know, it was such a foolish decision. Number two is that, you know, when you, when the whole world said go to the IMF early, you know, they, they might be hard, but restructure. Here is a country like Sri Lanka said, we are going to come out with a homegrown model. Now, both calamities went to a dead rock. And then, of course, you know, you have an unsolicited proposal that of reducing taxes from, you know, where the percentage of taxes to GDP came down from 12% to 8%. You know, when everybody said these are disaster modes, three clear initiatives that took us Sri Lanka down the tube. Now, the question is that in that background, uh, you know, uh, the question is that the private sector, and, and why I say private sector is because Eshan, who has been a chairman of Unilever in Sri Lanka, uh, knows how the, our private sector works. Now, if the private sector uh, had a Ratan Tata of India, you know, who takes the government on, you know, head on, understood, and, and you know, he runs a huge business, but he says, I'm not worried about you guys while making my business vulnerable to uh, uh, your, 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 your power. I'm going to say what I have to say, that kind of leadership, if he had in Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka would have not had this issue. But then, because the private sector and the key policymakers have failed to bring in this proper thinking by the politicians, today you have a set of youngsters who have got together from university who turned the whole country around. And you're talking about a president, Rachna, who, who beat the most ruthless terror group in the world. And today the guy is fleeing from one country to another. And who did it? A set of youngsters, kids between the ages of 18 and 23 years, you know? So it's a lesson to the world that I think we need to start giving the youngsters a chance to run key policymaking institutes, you know, provided that they have the um, proper training and they have the proper mentoring. Uh, that's one way that we can work it. And number two is that, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel, you know, rather than reinventing the wheel, we have a basic structure in place. 
you know you have the sac secretariat you have the sac development fund you have the sac disaster management you have the sac poverty fund you have the sac energy fund i mean you have every structure in place rachna right. you know all the documentation has been done Absolutely. but it's just that it's not operationalized so i think you know i mean i don't know rachna if you want to be the president of the sac secretariat i would put my hand up you know and 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 you know if some of us all get on to that board you know with the proper kind of um, authority and mandate from each of our governments uh, you know if we can just make some of those um, plans a reality in in a certain small way uh, i think that's going to be that's the biggest win i mean a classic example is there's a thing called a sac anti terrorism force okay now if this organization was active we wouldn't have had the easter attacks rachna because yes. in the middle of uh, india the information came in that there was going to be an attack and 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 i think uh, it came to the indian embassy and then for whatever reason indian embassy had alerted the sri lankan government but there was a gap of i think one week and our guys also you know a little bit lack as they see in their management and you had the you had 269 people dying and right. the whole uh, tourism right. structure failed on the ground a business which was giving us about 4 billion uh, income 4 billion dollars income tourism came to a crashing halt right you know and and rachna it's very easy for people to say you know we had 2.3 million tourists and in 2018 and 2019 even after the easter attacks you know we some or other notched in about a 1.8 million tourists but so those are only statistics because if you look at the quality of tourists that came in 2018 it was amazing you know you had the 200 300 dollar per capita income per day tourists coming in but in 2019 the guys were coming over at 68 dollars you know so so it was a huge blow huge blow you know you had the total informal economy that was bursting out but that was also taken off because so what i'm trying to say is that my answer to your question simple we have a sac forum we have all the structure is in place and i think it's time that you know the countries get together put the structures to be operationalized with a strong base of private sector thinking and i think that will be the best kind of contribution we can make to the to our part of the world over that's that's correct because i th- i think uh, if our effort of whatever we have done so far and whatever we uh, actions we will take in future if, if that ignites and uh, the existing that sac as an organization i think uh, we'll be home because that's the that's probably the the outcome that we are looking at in first year of this project rashma uh, if i just come in if i just come in here just want to yeah. share one more point before i lose this thought sure. you know matt andrews and uh, you know the team from harvard uh, you know i recommended them into the sri lankan hierarchy and then we brought them in in 2019 uh, sorry 2015 2015 uh, matt andrews came in with uh, uh, with the professor for trade and actually they did the whole master plan for 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 sri lanka so i was telling matt that you know ideally if you look at the harvard alumni you have a handful of people who have been selected for this kinds of program so if if we could get together under the harvard mandate you know and give some thinking into the things like the sac secretariat uh, i'm i'm sure matt and uh, the rest of the team there would definitely be the catalyst uh, and we could be the people who would operationalize this this project and since ishan happens to be chairman of the uh, business council in in uh, in pakistan uh, and rachna you being you know one of the top 74 strong uh, influencers on linkedin uh, i'm sure you know we could make a difference to sark definitely thank you for that and uh, thank you for all the knowledge because i think it would have taken us months to read all of these reports uh, the data that you've given us in the last 20 minutes um so my question um is we are for innovations and like i said we i we love to take it back um, so what is your uh, innovative ideas for us and how do we double our impact in the region sak so, i uh, rachna i missed you rachna sorry can uh, i have so the question I- again 
Yeah, so I was saying that we are for innovations and what innovative ideas do you have for us? How can we propagate um, and double our impact in the region and contribute in the world peace? See, Rachna, I mean, let's be clear here. What does India bring to the table? India brings knowledge. I mean, if you take your university system and the education system, I mean, you guys are fantastic. I mean, I, I, never, I never go to sleep in the night without watching an Indian uh, TV channel. Take it from me. I mean, I, I love the kinds of intellectual discourse that, that you have. And I mean, you guys are like, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, it's brilliant. The thinking that you have. All the product development houses, uh, are they are based in India. So, so I mean, we don't have that kind of um, uh, acumen in Sri Lanka, if you look at structurally speaking. So if private sector, like, I mean, if, if, if your organization could drive the new product development uh, into the Sri Lankan exporters, you know, uh, where you, you facilitate this, facilitate this, uh, this could be one way, but uh, be more competitive uh, uh, for these exporters to get into uh, to to do the Indian market. So, um, I mean, I could always introduce you to the Sri Lanka Export Development Board, and you know, you you, you can you guys can set up even a secretariat there if you wish. Um, you know, maybe you I mean you come through the government of India through the embassy, and then we set it up, and then through that. Maybe one option is that you focus on uh, how do you provide access to those uh, product development houses uh, in, into the Sri Lankan exporters for packaging development. It could be new product development per se. Um, it could be access to the Indian market. Uh, you know, in, in very clear spirit. That's, that's brilliant. Uh, that could be one, one key idea that I could bring. Yeah. I'm going to the embassy tomorrow. <laughs> Consider it done. All right, so my last question. Second, second Rachna. Rachna, yeah. second, second, let me just give you another idea. See, guys, our ICT and the BPO and the knowledge KPO industry uh, right. is about a billion dollars. But, uh, but we know that we are going to hit a $5 billion target. That's a, uh, that's, a, that's a quicker win than tourism in terms of getting dollars to Sri Lanka. Now, right. most of the countries, most of the companies which are operating here in Sri Lanka, like the HCL of the world, you know, are based out of India. India is the mother, is, the, is where the head offices are. But then what happens is that whenever, I mean, I was having a chat with your head of HCL and the hierarchy of Virtusa and the top companies who are Indian based. And what they said was that, you know, most of the, the news that travel about Sri Lanka is from Indian news channels. So what happens is that, you know, sometimes it is kind of not, not the exact reality which has been relayed. And, and what happens is all the guys who are running these top KPO and the BPO companies, those guys are totally like saying, hey guys, what's happening to Sri Lanka, you know? And, and they want to know whether they should relocate in Romania. Some are saying, let's relocate in Bangladesh. You know what I'm saying? Or, or, or do you think that we should, uh, you know, have another arm in, in Cambodia, you know? So, so one way that you guys can support how Foro can uh, come in uh, is where, uh, uh, you know, you become a platform of sharing proper data into the BPO companies who are operating in Sri Lanka, who are based in, who are based out of India, you know, so that then the proper communication comes in and, and, and I'm sitting right now with the ICTA, which is the Information Communication Technology Agency and we are trying to come out with a project where we are going to bring in 23,000 graduates every year to Sri Lanka uh, for the industry. Currently, it's about 30,000. So we have just got a partnership with uh, the government of Philippines and, and they've extended something like an scholarship of 2 billion Sri Lankan rupees. So, so we, are, we are doing options like that. So, so if y'all guys can come out with the communication which shares to these BPO industries, you can protect Sri Lanka. And then through that, we can see how we can trade up uh, into you know making this industry of five billion and 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 your organization needs to only just do a information 
uh, dissemination task and not an investment or whatever like that. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, so, so those are those are things that we could do and work together on. Um, and maybe the last point would be that uh, I don't know whether uh, it, this is possible, but I think it should be done. Is that you know one one country that we can drive a uh, tourism too as a priority is India. And, and in India, uh, there was one project that I started when I was chairman of tourism, which is the Ramania Trail. And the Ramania Trail is very, very popular. And I, and Kishore Reddy, who happens to be the chairman of the Indian CEO Business Council, uh, you know, when he saw that I launched, he came with his whole team and said, Ranta, I don't want you to spend any money in India. I will sponsor all the road shows. Each of our companies will sponsor the road shows in India and drive the Indian uh, Ramania Trail uh, devotees to come to Sri Lanka. So, oh so you know, if there is some kind of a facilitation mode that you all guys can do, uh, because currently we get about, I think, uh, 200, 300,000 tourists from India, you know, so in the next next uh, six months, you know, if we can bring in a hundred thousand tourists, you know, and, and if you all can support this, uh, this initiative, uh, which yeah. is also more advocacy kind of a thing, it's advocacy, huh? it's not investment. Uh, I would say these are the three key things that, uh, uh, you know, maybe our discussion that we spent today, uh, one hour is going to be fruitful, um, Rachna. I think I, I consider the first one done. <laughs> the third one is in, very interesting. The second one is something that I'm definitely going to have a, my heads up because it's something new to me. I am not very um, exposed to that part. But the fir first and the third one is like something that I definitely have my uh, interest as well as exposure in when I understand what you're saying. And I think I should be able to do that. Um, and my last question, Ronta, for you is what would be your advice today to the world leaders and the leaders of SAC? Um, I think, I think the, um, I mean, if I were to meet uh, the uh, Mr. Modi, uh, whom I, whom I, whom I write very often about, and whenever he comes to Sri Lanka, I would somehow find a way to say hi to him. Uh, I, I think uh, I would tell him, that, uh, you know, rather than giving aid to Sri Lanka and extending all the lines of credit, I would tell him to call the Sri Lankan hierarchy and tell them, uh, you know, I have access to markets. I'm going to open my uh, export markets to you guys for our 400 million people. I'm going to allow your tourism guys to come into Sri Lanka, uh, from Sri Lanka to India. Mm, and I want you to, I'm going to give you a 10 billion credit line, which is not on finance, but on trade and services. Uh, get your, get your skill sets up, uh, get your guys to work hard uh, in terms of supply chain development, because, you know, in Sri Lanka, the biggest problem is supply chain. You know, it's not that the people don't have uh, products to export, but how do you continue exporting at the same quality levels? You know, so that needs you to have a good backend supply chain organized. So, so that is one of the challenges we have. So he tells them, guys, get your supply chain right. I give you access to my market. I'm not giving you money. Okay, I'm going to give you. That's what I would do, uh, uh, Rachna, to the head of uh, India. But if I were to meet the head of uh, Pakistan, sorry, uh, if I were to meet the head of Maldives. I would tell them is that, you know, you know, your, your tourists, why don't we have a situation where they spend three days or four days in, in Maldive Islands and, and shall we spend five days in Sri Lanka? So why don't we do a package tour that every time when somebody comes to Maldives, you know, if you want to go and see the wildlife, you want to see 2,500 year ruins, you know, all that story, which you don't get in Maldives, come over to Sri Lanka, so do package tours. You know, that kind of interchange, that's what I would do. And of course, if I look at Pakistan, I mean, Pakistan is a, is a very dear friend to Sri Lanka. You know, we have a free trade agreement with Pakistan. Um, uh, and if you can just see how we can further operationalize the free trade agreement, 
uh, between our two countries, uh, I think uh, that would be the best, uh, biggest win uh, that we could have, you know, among us. Thank you. Not for Bangladesh, Bhutan. <laughs> Uh, see, uh, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, of course, uh, um, we have very strong links, uh, uh, Rachna, and most of the apparel companies, CEOs, are all Sri Lankans. So, because our apparel industry is so developed that people have gone and invest in Bangladesh uh, as a, as a uh, second, third uh, production facility. So, most of the knowledge transfer, talent transfer is already happening in Bangladesh. So, 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 so I would say that maybe that could continue, you know, that, that could continue further and, and further strengthen ourselves. And then of course, I mean, with Nepal, obviously it's all about uh, more to do with tourism and how we can drive bilateral trade between. Um, so, so I, I would say these are the kinds of very practical things that I would, um, uh, would request maybe the heads of state, but, um, I love uh, your incredible India campaign. It was one of the fantastic campaigns uh, that the world has seen. And it was, uh, it defies total uh, insights to brand marketing. Uh, and it was a decision that was taken uh, by two people and uh, successive governments have come and tried to change it in India, but they couldn't because that, camp that creative is so strong. So, so I mean, I, I love that campaign. Even <laughs> Thank you. County was very, very uh, eye catch. You know, one thought of Kerala uh, being really yeah, yeah, yeah. like that. It was done by Mr. Amitabh Khan, who's one of our uh, very, very bright leaders who's just resigned from the PIO after serving even maybe five, five to 10 years after being retired from the government service, he was one of the most uh, right and one of the most the cleanest ICE officers we've had in the history of the country. So um, thank you very much. We are absolutely on time. And uh, I would uh, be sure. John wants to say something. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes. Please, Mr. Malik. Yeah, okay. So I, I just wanted to, you know, some, some parting uh, thoughts. I think Rohit has done an excellent job in uh, contextualizing Sri Lanka, in particular in the context of South Asia. I want to say that, you know, whether whether it is India, Pakistan, or India, Sri Lanka, or Bangladesh, whatever, India is the biggest country. And as a big brother, big sister, whatever we'd like to call it, a lot of the lead will have to come from India. Um, that, that's my first point. I think my second point I'd like to say is that the, um, you know, in, in, certainly in the context of India-Pakistan, maybe the right thing to do is to start from the low-hanging fruit. Uh, and the low-hanging fruit is literally the fruit. Uh, and I'm talking about agriculture and food, not, not, not just for you know, food. I mean, there is a lot of interconnectedness between the, the you know, either side of the Punjab uh, border. Um, and, and, and therefore, that, that is, uh, that, 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 that is something that uh, you know India and Pakistan maybe should focus on as a quick win and a low-hanging fruit because there are times when 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 a particular fruit or vegetable or a crop is short on one side uh, and, and and it's abundantly available on the other side. So I think if that could could, could begin, it would really do the people of, of of both India and Pakistan a lot of good. I think those were the two parting uh, sort of words I want to deal with. I, I, was, I was about to conclude the session in so many words. You already said it, Mr. Malik, on, because I think he's given us a very deep Sri Lanka. And um, that's, why, that's why I say it's, it's almost like a rapid fire um, you know, course. Like they say, rapid. how do you learn English? And they run those courses. This is how we will learn about each other. I think we have had no knowledge whatsoever so far about SARC and South Asian countries. And this is time that we awaken, we arise, and I believe we stand for our dignity, South Asia, we stand for our roots, we stand for our history, genetics, culture, languages, and uh, a bright future. Uh, so with that, we will uh, close the session today. We are absolutely on time. And I uh, thank everyone today, whoever participated. We'll be sending the recording to all of our members in our database. And we'll see you very soon. Have a good evening, everyone.
Thank you. Thank you.